today is the awesome grace of being able to celebrate the gift of Jesus in all of the saints of Carmel in a single celebration. Just as November 1st we celebrate All Saints Day, the cloud of witnesses the book of Hebrews speaks about that accompanies us in following Jesus to the max, to the end. And that we're on this journey in Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, not alone, but we're surrounded by our friends in high places, this cloud of witnesses of Hebrews chapter 12 in the opening verses that is a reference to the saints of God that we see before the throne of the Lamb in the book of Revelation as being alive in God's presence, those closest of his friends who already share his glory. This is one big difference between Catholic theology and Protestant theology is that we don't believe that after we die and we've given up our last breath, that we're in a state of sleep until the second coming of Christ and that trumpet blast when there'll be the general uh, resurrection of the dead. But rather that at the moment of our last breath when we pass from this world, especially when we have died in intimate friendship with him, and most especially through them being clothed in his righteousness through the sacraments, that we come to see him immediately face to face in a particular judgment. And when we have died in a state of, of love in his will, that we are united to his heart and we are immediately brought into the kingdom of God. Even if we need still deeper healing and purification, our destiny isn't postponed until the second coming of Christ. And that's why we see in the book of Revelation the elders and the many witnesses of God already before the throne of the Lamb. And so the saints are very, very much alive. And this is very distinctly Catholic and Orthodox teaching in terms of the Christian faith from the time of the apostles. Protestants don't believe that. They have a different understanding, a different eschatology of, of how we come to union with Christ. In fact, today, this is a total distraction that doesn't relate to the All Saints, but in some respect, maybe it does relate to all Carmelite saints, and I'll try to touch on why. But today I watched a YouTube short um, those shorts, the one-minute clips on YouTube of very impressive-looking dude. He had an awesome beard, you know, cool, rock-steady hat. He was wearing his tank top, red tank top with a, a lion with a king's crown on it representing Christ. He was all yoked and tatted up. He just looked like a real hardcore kind of dude. And he was representing the Lord. You know, he was expressing his faith in Jesus, which is awesome. And... In, in expressing his friendship with God, he was saying, yeah, before I go to bed, I really invite the Lord to, to bring about in my, in my sleep, you know, a revelation of your word, of your truth to me. Speak to my subconscious and conscious mind in my dreams. Lord, I invite you. All right, that's cool. That's legit. No problem. That's cool that he has that intimacy with the Lord and everything. And then he said that he had a profound dream. And in this dream, he found himself in an elevator and he pressed the up button, but instead the elevator just started to just like, just fall down. Uh, it started going downward rather than upward. And as it's going down, it's, he's sensing himself going down into the depths of the earth towards hell. And he starts hearing all these screaming in this torment. And all of a sudden he starts to panic in his dream and he's telling the Lord, he says, Lord, you know, why, why am I going towards hell? Why am I being separated from you? And then he starts thinking of his good works. And he says, I was good to my wife. I was good to my kids. I helped the poor as best as I could. And all the while, the, the elevator is just like sinking deep and at a fast pace. And then finally he says, but Lord, I accepted you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Why is this happening? And then all of a sudden, the elevator comes to an screeching halt. <laughs> 
And the door opens and he has this encounter with God and through G the incarnation of Jesus, the incarnate Lord. And it's at that moment that he realizes that salvation, our being made worthy of heaven, comes only through our acceptance of Christ into our heart through faith. And that was his point. Is an evangel maybe evangelical or fundamentalist, I'm not sure. But his point was, none of our good works matter. Only thing that matters is faith in the heart in Jesus Christ as Lord. All right. On the surface, as a Catholic, we might, we'll say amen to that. We wouldn't contradict that. But as an atheist listening to that, or an agnostic listening to that, someone on the sidelines who doesn't know the beauty of Jesus of Nazareth as the incarnation of God's merciful love, when they hear that, if they're really thinking deeply and critically, what kind of image of God does that portray? What kind of image of God does that portray? And that's a big difference between, there's a big difference between our Catholic understanding of the face of God and, and what one of the weaknesses of Protestant theology and their understanding of soteriology of salvation. It can portray an image of God that I think misses the mark of the hallmark of his heart. And also at the same time portrays a very poor image of humanity, of the human person, an anthropology. Whereas Catholic theology in being the full revelation of the new covenant deposit of faith in an ongoing way from the time of the apostles portrays a far greater, more beautiful image and face of God as well as the human person. And we see this beauty of truth exemplified, expressed best through the wisdom of God's saints. And it's through the wisdom of the saints that we see the splendor of truth of Jesus Christ and as the divine word of God's revelation. So how are the Carmelite saints distinct from the saints of the universal church, of the saints that walked many different paths of life, but we remained united in the Holy Spirit? The saints of Carmel or the Carmelite order in comparison to all the other orders, um, such all the different other walks of life in the Catholic Church that followed a particular saint, like Saint Francis being the most popular saint in Christian history after the time of the apostles themselves. So we have Saint Francis and all the Franciscans with their countless different branches all follow in the footsteps of how St. Francis was passionately in love with Jesus Christ, how St. Francis embodies friendship with Jesus in a way that's distinct to the charism, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave St. Francis of Assisi. And the Franciscans are following in his footsteps, his charisma, of course, in their own distinct way, which is totally legitimate. The Benedictines following St. Benedict Dominicans following St. Dominic and the saints, the great saints in their, those traditions that came after their founders. But Carmel is an anomaly. The Carmelite order. We say Carmel for short. Now, of course, we know Carmel, Caramel, is the place in the Holy Land where Elijah experienced uh, God's holy presence and manifestation of his covenant love for his people in his personal life, and in the contest publicly with the false prophets when the fire of heaven came down as a prefigurement of Pentecost. And so Carmel is that Hebrew um, word that, re that represents paradise. So Carmel is an icon of paradise, our longing for heaven. And what is heaven? It's not a place, it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. He is our heaven. Why? Because he is everything. And to say that Jesus Christ is everything 
is to echo the, the truth of the sacred scriptures prophesied in the Old Testament, but especially explicit in the New. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all creation, the source and the summit of all that is true, good, and beautiful, of what God has, has set in motion in his intent, intention for creation to bring us into communion with him, a covenant communion of bonding with God in a nuptial way based on a relationship of love. And Jesus Christ is the perfect embodiment of God's desire that we be one with him in perfect love. And God so loved the world that he sent his only son to be the sacrifice that makes this union possible, this salvation, this healing restoration of our wounded humanity to make it whole and wholly capable of oneness with God's holiness. And it's through the mystery of the incarnation of God on the cross, Jesus Christ crucified, that this reconciliation of opposites takes place once and for all. The reconciliation of the opposites between our fallen, wounded, broken humanity, prone to sin, to disorder, to all that separates us from our true destiny and what brings us authentic happiness. The cross is the bridge between the abyss of our own woundedness and God's holiness, God's perfection. Jesus is in outstretched arms on the cross is the bridge that reconciles these opposites of the perfection of the cre creator and the woundedness of the creature. And in his humanity, in his sacred humanity, he he's becomes the, that bridge of uniting the human with the divine. And so the, our salvation began with, his, with Mary's yes, the incarnation. This is where salvation began, and it reaches its climax at the cross, its consummation in the resurrection, and it's pouring forth, giving birth to the church at Pentecost. And the saints of Carmel exemplify this unique gift of God in calling us to communion, a communion of love with him who is the love of loves in a relationship that's not only spiritual and personal, but spousal. And so the Carmelite spirituality is a biblical spirituality of the heart based on a relationship of divine love that emphasizes the absolute primacy of the Lord as God. God as one, God's absolute grace in, in taking the initiative to seek us out, to speak to us on our terms, and to unite us to himself in a way that only he can make us worthy of who he is. So Carmelite spirituality is a biblical spirituality of the heart that brings us into the holy of holies of the within of God, divine intimacy with the inner life of God as love. And through the incarnation of his son and the outpouring of his spirit, we come to discover something that the Jews never could have dreamed of and the Muslims continue to think is total heresy, that God who is one, who alone is all holy, the almighty and immortal, creator of all the cosmos, the, the ruler over all, the judge of righteousness versus wickedness, good and evil, that this all holy unity of who God is as one, as perfectly one, is three in one, not alone. That God though one is not alone because he is love, 
There must be someone that God can love that is equal to himself, that can receive the fullness of the gift of who he is. Because as human beings, we don't have the capacity to be perfectly one with God in divine love apart from the incarnation of, of God made man so that way humanity could be one with God. It's only through the incarnation of God's Son that we have our hope of heaven being one with Him who is everything. And in a oneness which is not a oneness that involves all of our humanity and gives all of our humanity a share in God's, the totality of God's divinity. This is the beauty of our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And the Carmelite saints entered into that beauty and it communicated it in a way that is second to none. And I'm not just saying that with the obvious bias because I'm a Carmelite, because the fact of the matter is I don't live up to that. But the grace of what God has given the church through Carmel and her saints is exquisitely unique and distinct. And there's a lot of layers to this to try to, to, try to capture or, or, or communicate the rapture of, of how beautiful it is, like looking through a kaleidoscope from all of its different facets to, to try to see the splendor. Because what the Carmelite saints reveal is what's the essence of divine revelation of love. The essence of what it means to be in covenant with God's mercy. The essence of a biblical spirituality of God who calls us into communion with him, to be one with him. So the spousal relationship of the heart based on love and God's absolute transcendence and initiative where it's all about him and, try, and, and the aspiration to enter into pure worship and adoration of the Lord as God, the abyss of his greatness, to enter into true worship of the magnanimity, magnanimity of his beauty. The whole of the charism of Carmel represents that. And when we look at uh, the, the rest of the saints in the church, not to say that the Carmelite saints are better, but to identify what makes them distinct and unique. There were certain saints throughout church history that also expressed this as spirituality, but it was a charism, a gift unique to them individually. Whereas karma, as a koinonia, a communion of faith, as a spiritual family, was given this charism. And because there is no specific founder of the Carmelite order, unlike the other orders that I've already mentioned, this charism of the Holy Spirit is embodied in certain personalities throughout history that communicate this essential gospel of sheer grace and the beauty of Jesus Christ as the mystery of God, the sacrament of God. Different Carmelites embody that according to the historical need of the church and the world at their time. The Holy Spirit brings about a manifestation in a, some, in a unique humanity of an individual saint for the church at a given time. So we see that in the life of Saint Teresa and all the women saints of Carmel, especially Teresa de Jesus, Therese of Lisieux, the child Jesus, Elizabeth of the Trinity, um, Miriam of Jesus crucified, they all embody the nature and mission of the church as spouse of the bridegroom. So in their own way, they embodied, like the Blessed Mother, the church as spouse of God, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. But they embodied that according to a need that was relevant to their historical era. Teresa of Avila during the time of the Protestant Reformation. Therese of Lisieux during 
uh, the time in which intellectual atheism was reaching its peak with Nietzsche. Uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity shortly after that, just before the two world wars, she gives us an adoration, a, a doctrine of adoration that is based in the praise of glory of the Holy Trinity in a time in which Islam uh, is again a relevant force of imperialism that's spreading significantly throughout the West and is a significant danger to Christianity. And so this, this fire of Elijah, which is the original inspiration of the Carmelites, can be seen in all of her saints according to the uniqueness of each of their personalities and how God inspired them to embody the life of the spirit of divine love, the essence of the gospel, and to communicate the heart of the church to the world. One of the important theologians of last century is a man by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar. And he wrote a lot on Carmelite spirituality, and there's this one treatise that he gives in speaking about Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. And in that opening paragraph to this introduction, he points out that God has given a special mission to Carmel for the church and the world in our day that is unlike anything else that we've seen in any other religious order. And he's not a Carmelite, but he's, an, I would, he's definitely a theologian and maybe even a mystical theologian. And he has a deep sense of the wisdom of the saints. And this is his assessment, that he, as he is seeing it, that Carmel has been given a mission to communicate to the world and the church the essence of the gospel. And one of the great gospels that communicates that is the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. When Jesus prays before his laying down his life on the cross during the Last Supper discourse. He prays for our oneness with God. Jesus prays before the, the Holy of Holies of the, God the Father's face. And he leads us into this Holy of Holies as he's praying for us. And he prays that the spirit of God's glory, the perfection of God's love for him may also be ours. And that through his heart, the Father may see and love in us what he sees and loves in his Son, and that the Father's love for us may be the same that it is for him who alone is perfectly holy. And we are brought into this in divine intimacy with God the Father's heart, and the holy of holies of who he is through Jesus' sacred humanity, the sacrifice of his life on the cross, and the majesty of his resurrection and ascension. Through the outpouring of the glory of God, the Holy Spirit, this, the love that unites the Father and the Son, we are brought into this communion. And that prayer of Jesus in John 17 best captures the charism of Carmel, the heart of the gospel, the heart of our faith, and the essence of the church, whose mission is not administration, it's not politics, it's not propaganda it's a mystical union with god with god the father the son and the holy spirit this is the church's vocation to lead us to true communion and pure worship of god as the love of loves and this is what the saints of carmel teach us how to let ourselves be loved enter into contemplation of the true face of God and to allow the light of his face to transform us in the fire of his life of love and to become that love for the world.